Welcome, John, to Titans of Transition. Hello, Joe. How are you doing today? I'm okay. It's uh, sunny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's let's talk places. Uh, you're you're in the UK. Do you say the yeah. UK or Great Britain? What do you guys prefer? England. England. <laughs> I missed it totally. <laughs> what part are you in? So London. I, I can't do it with a reverse mirror, but so it's called the Southwest and it's basically like the farming part of England. Ah. So yeah. Uh, but Exeter is the closest city four hours from London. Okay, cool. Well, listen, I'm really happy to have you on, on the uh, podcast today. And just for background, I found you because I'm a guitarist. I've, spend way too much time on YouTube perusing different material. There's a ton of people out there producing content, but I really connected with yours and we'll get into that a little bit more later on. But uh, I'm just kind of curious. I thought it would be good because uh, to really drill into what it's like these days to be a working musician. Back in, when I was growing up and when I started playing guitar, I had my dreams of being a rock and roll star and I always thought that, well, you know, I have to get a band and we have to get sort of known, get some music out. And maybe a label will pick us up and then everything will be like Nirvana, you know. Well, not the band Nirvana, but they'll all be wonderful. But it's very different today. So maybe just talk to us a little bit about that. We'll get into your background later on. But I thought it'd be nice to start with what you're doing. What's part of your business right now? Elements of it. OK, so. Essentially. On the weekends, I guess my job looks a lot like quite a lot of um, professional or semi-professional guitarists at whatever level. So that would be playing in function bands for mostly like weddings and that sort of stuff. And like you say, I think growing up, you, maybe that wasn't the dream at all. And maybe you'd think, you know, the traditional route is mostly what we hear about and things like getting signed, all those things that you talked about there. But the reality, I think, is probably for most people a little bit different. If you are doing the thing and you're not part of like the less than 1% that do that traditional route, I think probably the lion's share of musicians tend to be either doing kind of function gigs or touring at various levels. And then there's a lot of folks that I know that do kind of like the online studio kind of stuff. For me, most of my time is spent making videos uh, in my bedroom. <laughs> yeah, and you, I mean, you pump them out. I see at least a couple a day, in many days. So one transition happened recently. I, <laughs> I had a daughter. Um, <laughs> yes. And so I've gone from doing two a day to one a day. And I think that's probably more reasonable anyway. Yeah. Since about 2019, I was doing two, sometimes three a day. Um, but the main reason I do it, to be honest, is just so that I have an excuse to play guitar and create something every day. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So since you're doing it anyway, you figure, well, why not? Right. Yeah. Why not put it out there? And again, talking about what it means to make a living this way, there's multiple streams of income. People used to think you could make a lot of money, like AdSense revenue, of, of YouTube. That's not so much the case now until you get really enormous, but you also have a Patreon page. You also hope people will buy you a coffee, <laughs> make yeah. a donation, but why don't you talk about some of the other things you do? Okay. Yeah. So before lockdown, I would say most of my money was from the kind of function gigging. And, and so the thing with that is that you basically, you have like a, a limited amount that you can do right? You can do maybe five, six gigs a week. And that 
involves a lot of traveling generally around the UK. I used to, you know, be driving to and from these gigs and you get back home at like two o'clock. Once lockdown happened, it happened hand in hand that the online stuff started to, to grow to a level where they were starting to meet in the middle. And mm. so basically my streams of income are, as you say, the YouTube ad revenue, Patreon, the, the buy me a coffee thing, uh, the gig money. And then I guess I also sell presets for like the bits of gear that I use. And then a tiny bit of money occasionally comes from companies who sponsor, like they might, you know, ask if I do a demo of a piece of gear and I generally say no to those or, or don't respond. Um, <laughs> and then uh, actually uh, true fire, that, true fire as well. True fire, that, yeah. That, that's a, a, a nice thing as well. So they came to me, I think because of Keith from five Watt world said, this guy does a thing. And it kind of made sense because there's a mixture of stuff on my channel. I try to do two lessons a week, basically, or lesson type videos. So it's not all just based on gear. Hopefully some of it is sort of useful for someone, but yeah, true fire, obviously then basically I run an advert at the start of every video and they pay me some amount of money for that, which yeah, helps. Yeah. And so I'm sure <clears throat> there are many people consuming content across your, your uh, YouTube channel and others. Um, they're like, oh, that's great. Oh, that's good. I'll take that. That was a great lesson. And they don't realize, <laughs> you know, that that actually is one leg of your, your stool, so to speak, for your revenue. I do see great engagement on your channel. People say nice things. Hopefully they also support you. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite lucky. I think that generally the people that happen across the channel and stay on it are generally polite. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I, I was curious about this. Um, obviously, with a newborn, how old is she now? She's 18 weeks, I think. And your wife's name? Liana. Liana. And your and your or, daughter's or name? Lenny. Lenny. Okay. And your daughter's name? Elodie. Say that again? Elodie. So like Melody without the L. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah. So obviously, that takes priority. So... <laughs> If you're in the middle of doing something and, and you get the handoff, you have to deal with it. But generally speaking, you wake up, you, know, you have an idea what you're going to work on, or you just say, well, I'm kind of curious about, you know, this thing I saw from another artist. And I think I'll dig into that and start recording. Just curious how, how that works for you. Okay. So uh, there's a few things. So I kind of take film notes on my mobile phone of mm. ideas if they happen to be a thing I think I might want to remember. And so generally this might be like a new kind of pattern or something like that. So I take a film of that and I think, right, I might be able to use that for a lesson at some point. Um, that's one kind of thing. So that's kind of the most planned stuff that I do. Mm -hmm. Then other things I might see an article that I think is interesting. So I might see something that someone that I am inspired by as a guitarist. So sometimes I email those to myself and say, make a video on this. So I have like this bank of ideas really that uh, kind of floats around, but I also have these key topics that I'm interested in. So it might be like specific pieces of gear, like amp modeling devices or certain guitars or certain guitarists. I think, you know, this is probably like common with every single thing you, you start to develop your own niche the more you do it and so my actual day goes like I get up generally at about 7 30 and most of the morning now up until about nine o'clock is involving like cleaning bottles and stuff and <laughs> getting stuff ready <laughs> I sometimes get a chance to just play some guitar then but not loads and then nine o'clock I feed the dogs and then I start on something. So generally each video will start with me just sitting in front of a camera with a, a, a click track going and I basically start the video like you might have seen in the intro. Yeah, yeah. And then I put the music around it. So I record with that click track and then I put in drums and all that sort of stuff. Play a solo over it, sometimes before I've done the rest of it. And that is kind of 
that's the engine of why I do any of this at all. So that moment is what I do YouTube for, if that makes uh -huh. sense. Yes. Because that's yes. the thing that I want want to do and thought that I would do as a kid. It just happens that no one else really needs that stuff. It's just I'm doing it for YouTube, if that makes sense. Well, okay. I, I think I disagree a little bit. I think a lot of people give value out of that. I mean, um, it seems yeah, but, like, you know, it's not like the traditional, like someone gave me a brief and said, oh, do oh this. yeah, it's just, yeah, whatever. It's just like a bit of creativity um, and a chance for me to play guitar every day. Basically, after that, it, it generally will be, well, what was the topic for this video? What am I thinking about? It might have been that I just had a gig last night and I was thinking, well, this happened or that happened. It's all quite spontaneous, just based on stuff that's either happening in my life or that, is, that I've seen basically mm -hmm. through the day and then put that together. So I think generally that the recording, the music part of it generally takes not so much time. And then <laughs> the, the next part, you know, mumbling to a camera. <laughs> And then editing it together takes a bit more time. So it maybe takes two, three hours overall, sometimes less than that, sometimes more, depending on how involved it might be. The lesson type stuff, there's often quite a lot of work that I have to go into creating the stuff that people can then, you know, follow along with and all that sort of stuff. So that's the video for the day part done. And I have to take it all downstairs and then I upload it from there. And create a thumbnail and that sort of stuff yeah <laughs> and sometimes that actually i can use that moment if i was for instance working on new songs sometimes i would use so for a gig for instance i would use the first part of the video where i do the creating music stuff i might take an idea that i've been working on like it might be a song by prince or something sneak it in <laughs> So that yeah. way you get bang for your buck. Yeah. One thing, two, yeah. two benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, two birds, one stone. That's, then... it. That's what I was searching for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something less aggressive to the birds, maybe. But then the rest of the day from there, these days I'm not getting as much time to actually play guitar as I used to, mm. but I think that's maybe part of growing up. <laughs> so then answering questions, for people via email, that sort of thing. Does that tend to Work be late at night? Stuff. Sorry? Does that tend to be late at night? No, no, I no? never do it at night. No, try to, night is the time for relaxing. Because obviously, I don't, well, not obviously, because no one's going to know who I am. I do this every single day. I don't actually take a day off. So it, it I try to at least not be working on stuff too much at night unless my wife is working on something else, then I might go and just start and do another kind of recording in the night or something like that. Then I guess if I had new material to work on for, you know, sets that were upcoming, I'd do that in the day after I've done the video, if that makes sense. Or if yep. I'm going away, like I just went away for a few days to Wales, you may have heard of it. You did some weddings or? Wales. No, I have heard of Wales, but I was yeah. thinking maybe, are you talking about your weekend gig you did recently? No, no, we just went on holiday for a couple oh, of Oh, you years. actually went on actual holiday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I say holiday. It doesn't feel like a holiday anymore. But um, <laughs> so basically it meant that I had to then bank videos beforehand. Yeah. If that makes sense. So yeah. that's what the yeah. day is then used for. Rinse and repeat then, right? Basically. It's essentially, yeah. And then sometimes I might get a chance to just play guitar downstairs or something like that. And that's mm -hmm. kind of my holiday. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You mentioned a few minutes ago about kind of coming to establish a little bit of a niche or a niche. One of the things that I connected with was how you were working with various different modelers. So you, you did uh, a number of episodes talking about the, the raging debate between amp versus modelers and then you use different modelers showing people how you dial in your tones which you don't often get that specific when i look at other creators out there so that's i think really a high value for guitarists is to see how you're what you're working you know specifically on to get 
really good tone and making suggestions. So obviously you're doing this, you're kind of chasing your own interest by looking at these other devices, but at the same time, or answering your own questions. So you've done that with modelers and you also have done the episodes comparing contrasting guitars. And I think most recently you did an episode, a couple of them talking about, do you really need to spend this much money on this super high-end pro guitar? And does it really make a difference? So those are all really great topics. That's been the thing that I've tried. So with all of the, the stuff, so in particular, I, there are videos from back in the day where I'm talking through stuff or I might not even have been talking through stuff. So I would just upload kind of videos of me playing guitar and none of that stuff really connected. And it's obvious to me now because mm -hmm. like there's loads of people doing that. And like you said, you know, if you're talking about a piece of gear, to me, it makes most sense that people could hear the thing. And then if you're going to talk about the thing, you might as well show them how you got that result. And then in that way, at least you've not wasted all of their time. <laughs> so that's the thinking for me was that I can, with all of these things, I can pretty much show you on the screen exactly what to do. And hopefully that means that you can get something out of the video rather than it just be me going, well, here's the thing. You could buy it if you want or not. It's more that, well, I guess I've made this video. And if enough people find it useful, then sort of the money will generate itself anyway. If that right. makes sense. I think the more important thing you, you just talked about was just playing the music sometimes doesn't really connect and give you a following, but sharing your actual journey, you know, musical journey, life journey. You talked about your doggies, right? Sometimes it's, I've, I've had to take my iPad over and show my wife, he's a musician, by the way. And I said, look, Look, look at these dogs jumping up in his lap when he's trying to play, you know, which I think is, it, it connects, you know, it really connects to people. There's a human being on the other side of that TV screen or that computer screen. I think that's a thing as well that people often talk about. And I think it's an easy thing to try to get across, but I think in, in so many ways, it's also super easy to get a bit wrong. Uh, does that make sense? Like, it's, mm -hmm. I know people n probably know it, but I think you have to find your way to actually doing it where it doesn't feel super forced. I get people sort of ask about various things, uh, you know, like, should they start YouTube and stuff like that? And for me, the answer is that absolutely my life would have been totally different if I hadn't. But Equally, I couldn't recommend to anyone else that you should make one or two videos every single day. Like, it seems. <laughs> I'm lucky to do two a month. <laughs> yeah, it's not a scalable model for most people. So it's a bit of a weird one where it is work, <laughs> work for me. But th that's what I mean in terms of trying to keep that in mind as well with all of the various things. Yeah, no, but I think you touched on another thing too. And that's you can't force it. It has to be authentic, right? Hmm. And for you, it's kind of like finding your musical voice. You have to find out what your tone is. You have to find out, do your own expression once you get to a certain point. So this is a, actually a good place to segue this kind of behind the scenes discussion of John and his typical day. And 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 let me ask you, um, how how did you get to where you are? So did you go to, when you were in school, well, let me back up even further. Do you come from a musical family? So yes, so my mum and dad, so my mum plays saxophone, my dad plays trombone and myself and my brother. So we grew up on a farm. We didn't have much money, but the money that mum and dad did have, they spent on piano lessons for us. Mm. So like from the age of five, I had piano lessons. Uh. When I was eight, I got a guitar, which is what I wanted all along. <laughs> <laughs> they forced you to um, do the piano first, right? Yeah, yeah, because it's we a had a thing. piano class and I'd already created a dent in my dad's guitar when I was four, <laughs> and he didn't let me play it after that. I think they also bought me a ukulele, but I hit my brother with it, so they broke it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So then, uh, age fourteen, so I did like the traditional in the UK. We have grades for piano. If that makes sense, like mm -hmm. uh, 
exams and all that sort of stuff. I did up to grade six by the time I was 14. It goes up to grade eight and then that's like whatever level. And at that age, 14, I decided I'd rather practice guitar. And so I think because I, I don't know, read things about people like Steve Vai and Joe Satriani and people like that, that they had to practice a lot. So I just decided that I practiced for two hours every day at age 14 and wow. fit the rest of my life, like revision and skateboarding around that. Um, at age 18 or whatever, I went to university and did commercial music, it was called, but it was a waste of time. So I dropped out of that after two years. <laughs> Because I didn't learn anything. It was just a waste of money. Um, <laughs> anyway, and then I went and worked <laughs> at the supermarket. So that was a transition. <laughs> that was a supermarket transition. All right. Yeah, yeah. So, that, John, were you like uh, uh, singing songs to the patrons as they came in at the no, supermarket? No, I think I bought uh, a, a proper computer that I could record with and do the music stuff that I basically do every day today. But I did it from about the age of 16 because my parents basically incentivized me to get good grades by saying, well, my brother actually, by saying, if you get an A, we'll give you a hundred pounds. Mm. My, my brother, it didn't really work for him. He didn't revise. <laughs> so I decided that I'd revise and then uh, bankrupted. <laughs> so, so then I, I bought a computer with that, which became the thing I would record with all the time. And all through university and even whilst I was working at a supermarket, I would still record loads of music but I didn't really have an outlet for it because I was working in a supermarket, but I would occasionally like put stuff online. Like I think sound click and SoundCloud is the other Sound, one SoundCloud. which came later. And I'd occasionally say to people, well, this is some stuff that I've recorded like people do. Um, but yeah, so then yeah, working in a supermarket, then I got another job. And then in about 2015, I, got the idea really that it made more sense for me to try to do music and earn less money than to try to do like the corporate world or whatever and earn more money but be miserable if that makes mm. sense because it was like it makes a was lot what of I sense thought I'd be doing from a young age yeah I then basically started on the road that I'm on now and I think in my first year, I, I made like £5,000. Yeah. <laughs> I lived at home yeah. at the time. Yeah. I lived at home for quite a while. Um, but luckily, my parents were kind of supportive in that way. And it it's worked out eventually. Yeah. Hey, what was the question? <laughs> How did you really make this transition? That's the question I have in my mind. Is, oh, yeah. You've yeah. taken us through your journey. and But that one point where you said, I decided that I'd be much better off pursuing what I wanted to do, I'm putting words in your mouth now, music, rather yep. than do the corporate thing. So was that a sort of an epiphany? Did you get the bright sunshine on your head or did you, but did it take a while or was it just like you knew in your gut? How did that conclusion come to you? Well, I think it all happened at a similar sort of time, but so I was in an originals band at this time, but you'd only do a very limited amount of gigs for this sort of thing. In, in the UK so when you're chasing this idea of being like in a signed originals band so I worked a real job alongside that but I would go stay at my friend's house and we had some relative level of success so we were on Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan our music was used <laughs> during a suicide bombing at a cafe <laughs> <laughs> which is it's what I always dreamed of. Um, and what else? The, yeah, various kind of <laughs> bits and pieces like that. But the yeah. money for that sort of stuff was always very slow to come through because if it's mm. royalties and that sort of stuff, yeah. it takes a long time. And alongside that, I'd started going to some open mic nights and stuff like that in Exeter. And from that, a few opportunities came. And in my job previously... I had to travel and stay in various places around the UK. And it, there started to be this kind of tension and a bit of a clash where I was like, well, I want to do this gig, 
which is not going to have much money or it might be like 30 quid or 50 quid or, but it was fun versus I could go and stay away for a week in my job so I just eventually decided even if there's not much money in this music thing it's actually a bit more gratifying so I just said to my boss at the time I think I want to try and do the music thing so um, basically yeah. the safety and security of a of a more substantial consistent paycheck was getting in the way of your passion yeah yeah and like opportunities it hadn't really occurred to me that this other path of like that, that most musicians actually go down with the non-traditional thing if that makes sense although it's it's like one percent of people that can actually make money yeah. with the traditional thing but everyone else basically makes money doing the things that every other guitarist basically does for money whether that's teaching or going out and playing gigs for normal people that are just there to hear music at a wedding or whatever and also that was the other thing so I think as younger people or certainly me as a younger person I saw the kind of covers gig as a bit of a I, don't know, I used to look down on it I think and then once you've done a few originals gigs for no money where you've driven across the country <laughs> and you get paid nothing yeah. or you've done three of them even so I, we supported a guy in Bristol and Liverpool and London and playing to sort of like 1800 people and 900 people here just supporting but there's no money not even for fuel <laughs> and then mm. you think all right I could play this wedding and you you get paid basically a good amount of money it made me think like the respect of originals music doesn't really translate to food on the table right well, like, like we talked about earlier, that, that situation has changed a lot over the, the past several decades. A friend of mine, which I also interviewed, uh, Michael Ghetto, he's a pianist and a composer, uh, really in the new age space. Earlier in his career, he put out like 11 albums. He's on Spotify and a lot of different platforms. If you go into any of those kind of uh, genre of music, you'll see him. You'll see his right. older albums being played. Very well known. And yet... He couldn't make a living at that either. And so he ended up teaching. He took the teaching route. So you do what you need to do if it's if it's overlapping with or congruent with your desire to be a musician. I remember having conversations with him about, why don't you do another album? And he ended up doing one. And he, but he's he's like where you are now. He's like, oh, no, I got to do all these promotional things, you know. Uh, the world has changed a lot since those days. So that percentage of people that you're talking about has gotten very thin that mm. make money the traditional way, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, I think that's where most of the attention gets yeah. spent, obviously, yeah. for obvious reasons. But I think even at um, sort of college level, I think I wrote like an essay for a piece of coursework about what the the musician or what my life as a musician might be like and even back then I, I I didn't really have any idea of being like a famous musician or whatever it was always about multiple income streams and multiple pies and fingers and that sort of stuff <laughs> so I, I think I've always known that especially as like my personality on stage and playing is never been like flamboyant or anything that is actually going to get attention so luckily I think I, I always knew that but I went away and did jobs that weren't fun so that then when you come back to music and I tried to say this to, to like younger friends that I might have as well that I do think it's important to have at least tried a real job if that makes sense because there's an attitude that can come if you're always used to doing these kind of function and wedding gigs that well and it happens to, to everyone I think you get quite jaded and tired of them and take them for granted but to me it's still way more fun to be playing covers than it is to be working in the supermarket no doubt no yeah. doubt absolutely and I think there's a lot of people out there that kind of do the hybrid thing too that haven't gone all in 
they might be doing the weekend gigs and has a traditional job. So however you get that part of you filled, I think it's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, mm. But you're a lot younger than me. So I can see that when you were in college and wrote your essay that you already knew it was going to be multiple streams of income. When I was your, that age, I was like, well, I'd already given up on being a famous guitar player, <laughs> which is not that good. I just have played at church on the weekends for years and years and years. So that, that fulfills my musical need. I, I did that as well. I oh. forgot to mention that, didn't I? That's okay. So I, I, I was very shy as a kid, but we went to this church that had quite an active kind of music thingy, you know, like sort of more on the... What's the word? You know, the more modern side of church. Contemporary? Yeah, that sort of thing. Whatever the word yeah. would be that's not a pejorative. <laughs> um, so, but they, they, they were quite like accepting and encouraging. And although I was pretty shy, so I sort of face forward instead of to the, to the, your, your, like, your stage presence is what you're getting at, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, that wasn't the thing for me. Um, but yeah, I think that is important as well. And that's one of the things that people outside of the church, I don't think there's as much opportunity for that mm -hmm. for whatever reason, because there aren't, you know, just church bands is a thing isn't it um so i played bass for years in a church yeah. and guitar so that was helpful i think in terms of getting used to actually playing with people and i, yeah. I would say yeah. you know if there are people out there that have had like you you have phases where you go away from playing in a band or whatever i think at any stage where you want to come back to it, it is i think still really re rewarding and fun even yeah especially for me like it's just the weekend stuff is i don't know it kind of makes it make a bit of sense when i was quite young like in we call junior high school here i i've had a little bit of had we had a little band playing you know clapton and Jimi hendrix kind of destroying those songs in our own unique way but uh i never really knew how to play with other people until i I got schooled. When, uh, we've lived in a number of different places in the U.S. When we were at a church in California, there was quite a professional bass player there. And uh, I remember him in the middle of rehearsal turning to me and, and looking at me, giving me the look, and la later on walking up to me and saying, Now, Joe, just because there's six strings doesn't mean you have to play every string on the chord. <laughs> and then he would say, I think you need to learn more inversions. Nice. <laughs> he would also turn to the, the worship pastor. She was excellent on piano. And uh, if Nancy watches this or Michael, I'll get myself in trouble. But she, he would look at her and you know what bass players say to piano players, get off the bass line, right? All right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I learned a lot about how to play in a group mm -hmm. at church. However you get that, it's a very different thing than playing in your bedroom or playing for your own enjoyment to know how to play with others. That was sort of an interesting segue. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, I enjoyed it. Um, yeah. So let's, let's take a different direction here and go back to the question I ask to just about everybody that are my guests. It's, it's, it's usually framed at what are the lessons learned or... What advice would you give to your younger self? So this is something I've kind of realized now, but I don't think that university is, if you're going to go down the route of musician and that sort of stuff is necessarily the most useful. I think if you can get involved with people that are playing music that are older than you, then that is at least as useful uh, that are making money doing it, if that makes sense. That's mm -hmm. as least at least as useful as getting into secondary education in it unless you need a degree for something but in in any case you might as well just do a degree in that rather than in popular music <laughs> it, it, that's <laughs> that's been my experience of that and i've got a friend who's actually at the age where he would have been at university and he didn't do that and instead has been gigging and I don't know if it's maybe just an isolated example, but for me, it, it looks to me that he's quite a lot further down the path 
than I would have been at that age because obviously it took me out of university and then starting basically back at zero anyway to get back to that level if that makes sense so yeah I think if you can get involved whilst you're still young people do like young people and that's I think <laughs> yeah yeah you know like definitely. young people in a band yeah I think mentoring that sort of thing happens right and people are looking for people to mentor it's just a just the way the world seems to work so that that'd be that I'd say do things rather than overthinking things and this is mm. this is I was not the most outgoing kid and I know there was a jazz school at my band that I never got involved with there were various bits and pieces that I just didn't get involved with for whatever reason and looking back probably I'd have been in a better position if I'd said yes to a few more things and whatever your reasons for not doing a thing are there are probably a bunch more reasons why you would benefit if you said yes to a few different things they're positive things obviously so I have this I had this thought I mean is is this kind of in that space so why would you not do a thing? Is it because you're playing it too safe or could there be other it, reasons? It could be that. It could be that you're generally shy or it could also be that you're waiting for things to be in a different state. So this is a thing that maybe I thought as a kid that I would work on something for this long and then suddenly opportunities would start to happen. Actually, that's not how things work at all. <laughs> it ha turns out that as you put yourself out into the world, kind of opportunities happen and you grow along the way. The journey is where the growth happens. It doesn't really happen so much in isolation. Mm. And that's been true with the YouTube stuff as well. I could think like my production quality or whatever is not good enough. I'm going to wait until whatever. Uh. But actually probably whilst you're still working on your thing people aren't gonna find you that much anyway but as you mm -hmm. go along the journey people are following you along for the journey it's just the thing you get better at things as you go i think that's the case for everything right 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 i think that's been my experience in other areas as well is that we tend to not want to step out until we think we we've nailed it mm. and really give way too much weight I mean, you have to practice, you have to work on your own craft. Um, but if you have the mindset that it's, it, you're going to do it all in isolation and then you're going to step out and hit the crest of the wave and surf your way in, it doesn't work that way because there's a really large percentage of my experience of a positive feedback loop of being together and getting honed by just doing the thing with others in the real world does that make sense to you yeah yeah is that resonating yeah yeah i think it's just not being is it afraid or just whatever the thing is that's meaning that you don't necessarily go out and you know go to an open mic night that again the open mic night slash jam night is for me where all of the opportunities came from i'm assuming that most people are interested in doing the like the work at home anyway, particularly if you're like me, where you didn't really want to go out loads or you're a bit shy or you're obsessed with guitar or whatever, but going out and meeting people in these various circumstances. So whether it's an open mic night or a jam night, that sort of stuff is where stuff happened or equally the online stuff, I guess is sort of similar where yeah. instead of, having to wait until your thing is totally perfect by which point you upload it and only three people are going to see it anyway most likely <laughs> until you've beginning. done quite a lot of it yes yes so for me it's more like well each thing that you put out so whether this is music or videos now is just like a mark of today yeah it's not saying that this is a perfect thing it's just a thing that is a point in time and you let that thing go for me. I do coaching on the side. I've done career in executive coaching because I had this whole other career in, in technology. But 
one of the things uh, that we put out often as coaches, or at least I did, was challenging people to get off the outcome. Because if they're so focused on the outcome, they're missing what's happening in the now. Mm. And there's learning in the now. And you don't really have the best vision for what the specifics of the outcome are going to be anyway. Because as you go through the journey, you change what you want. You get clarity yeah. on what that looks like. And I imagine that's happened for you too, as, as you, now you're dad. So now you've got to factor that in. And that's part of your overall best outcome, right? And dad of seven and a half doggies or whatever it is. <laughs> You've understated uh, it. It's seven and three quarters. Seven and three quarters. Okay. Only missing one leg on that dog. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that's really good advice. First thing you said was don't think that you have to go to university for music, do the traditional thing. And then we're talking now about it being a journey as well. The first one uh, goes back to a concept of programming or conditioning. We hear so much about the way it should be that we think we have to follow a certain course. And many people I've talked to, they become a lawyer or an IT person or something because their parents told them they would be good at it or something. Or they just thought kind of loosely about it and just went down that path. And then decades into their, their journey, they go, really, this kind of sucks. I don't want to. <laughs> you know? And they make a, a pretty big transition. For you, it seems like it's been more evolutionary, right? And you might have taken some other turns and maybe shifted things a little bit based upon what you've learned along the way. But you pretty much were pointed toward music from a very early age, except for the, the grocery thing. For a little yeah, while. the music kind of was always there, but the university thing really knocked me off that path rather than anything else. I made some really good friends there, I think in general but actually it was probably a fair reflection of the industry as well in terms of a few people at university probably is going to benefit quite well and maybe those folks are going to get into touring bands and stuff like that so there there are people that can thrive in that environment but i don't know it's just, just uh, for me it didn't really work mm -hmm. I, I might as well have just done any other course at university really um probably because yeah it would probably be more beneficial well it's just you know you come to those conclusions and i think you have to be kind with yourself that's the other thing too i think back about my career shifts i thought well, i spent several decades doing something that i was successful at but it burned me out i was just what's the expression smashed to bits i by the end of the day i was just yeah. had no energy. I was just completely drained and I was getting the financial rewards, but I only kept doing it because I, it to provide my, for my family, you know, mm. but it wasn't giving me a lot of joy. That's for sure. Yeah. This is what I meant earlier when I said about, I couldn't advise anyone to, to follow my lead or whatever. I don't think that there's so much of everyone else's journey, which is totally not, not the same. Yeah if that makes sense so you know someone else is probably not going to even want to do a video every single day or like three thousand videos before they start getting anywhere do you know what i mean like in terms mm -hmm. of relative success i'm probably like the least successful person on youtube <laughs> versus work put in if that makes sense so i think at least yeah i don't know what am i trying to say by that i've forgotten <laughs> well i think what you were saying was that giving other people advice in context of your own unique journey is a little bit, you have to think about it a little bit because not everyone's lives are the same. Mm. Not everyone's wired the same. They're not, the yeah. situation's not the same, right? Yeah. The, the thing that I've, I've found that I think is universally true, probably, is that if you're going to get good at a thing, you have to find a way to make it consistent. Mm -hmm. So you make it a thing that you are consistently going to try to do. You talked talk to us earlier about the pattern you have, the daily pattern you have, right? Mm. So you have an intention to your own development and you've established a habit to doing that. And that provides you with the structure 
in order to continue to work on your mastery. So what, I guess it maybe goes hand in hand with it, but generally with anything, it's going to require like a good amount of work, if that makes sense. Like uh, probably before you see, before you hear of people on YouTube, they've probably done a load of work that gradually got them to where they are or in whatever field they're in, there aren't really many overnight sudden success stories or although we see like things that are viral or whatever, probably there's had to be quite a vast amount of work beforehand. So the thing that has been important for me is having uh, a really easy, clear workflow, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. basically that I can just literally come into the room in the morning and the thing that I'm working on it, I'm not having to set up. There's no kind of blockages. I just do the thing. And I think maybe that's probably the same for other things as well. That if you were trying to get good at a, a thing, like you wouldn't pack your guitar away every day if you wanted to play it every day. Right. Because that yeah. would, it would be a, a blockage between you and doing the thing. Yeah. Anything could do to remove the friction hmm. from your intent. Yeah. Uh, is a good thing to do. It's having everything kind of the whole hands distance, everything at the ready. And if you took all your guitars and you put them downstairs or some other place, and every time you had to think about it, it's like the workout thing, you know, well, I have this great piece of gym equipment. It's like three flights of stairs away from me. And then mm -hmm. on the way up, there's the coffee pot or the tea kettle. And there's this, the TV with the remote and you're basically setting yourself for, up for failure rather than intentionally build your workflow and your environment to support your intention. Yeah. I think as well, part of the thing, if you're going to do a thing with any sort of scale, as in like thousands of hours spent doing a thing, then probably naturally some of these habits will start to form. But I maybe if you go into it with the idea, if it's a new thing, that having a workflow that is going to support you spending loads of hours doing it. I think maybe that helps a bit. So that that was kind of the thing where people ask me about, you know, how do you do that or how do you do this, or whatever. It's that every single day I just do the thing and that naturally things have evolved in a way where there aren't as many blockages to doing the thing. That yeah. Makes sense. yeah. Where, where you're naturally you're, you become a bit quicker at doing what's going on. Eventually you learn how to focus a camera, which took me a lot of years <laughs> and still don't get it right all the time. And that's the other thing as well is that, as I said earlier, like each day, it's just a representation of the thing. So whether the project is however long, I guess it'd be different for different people, but all the thing is, is the best you could do in that moment. It doesn't have to be the most perfect thing in the world and not everyone in the world is going to see what you did anyway so mm -hmm. i try to keep that in mind that you don't want to block the thing with yeah. too many thoughts about yeah like you said the outcome i guess that's the thing with social media uh, yeah, as well yeah. where yeah. people are concerned about the amount of numbers and stuff and i try to encourage people as well that it's not really about the success of one or two posts it's more about over time but yeah. that's what it's been for me anyway, trying to leave enough things behind that people will eventually Catch find up. Them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, having the long view. Absolutely. That's that's great. I want to pivot as we work, bring the plane in for a landing here, so to speak, because <laughs> we've been going for a while down tangents, but I've loved them. Hopefully yeah. somebody else will connect with them. <laughs> uh, it'll be interesting to see what the retention graph is, as to your earlier point. <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't, I don't look at that either. Yeah, that's a scary thing. Are there any projects? You're doing your normal things, right? Um, are you working towards anything else? Or are you continuing to turn the crank on what you've been doing? Obviously, you have a new baby, so that's yeah, a new so this, project. This is one of those things and thoughts. So as you might be able to tell, I have like certain habits that have formed. The thing that I don't have at the moment uh, a very good idea of is how I would turn things into like a larger project with like more planning. Because So all of my music stuff is improvised. So I've 
people become very used to the idea of starting with nothing and quite quickly having something it's not of any value but like something and then but i do sort of fear in some ways that i might be missing out on other things that if i you know had a larger project that makes sense so what i'm trying to think about at the moment obviously right now i'm just sort of maintaining is an idea of a larger project in some way so probably for me it wouldn't be an album because i don't think there'd be much interest in it but it might be in something like a course with more of a through line or you know something more planned or yeah if that makes sense i'm trying to think in my head about how my workflow at the moment wouldn't really support that i don't think unless i I'd, I'd have to sit down and maybe talk to someone about <laughs> what what yeah. how i would do it, if that makes sense well you have a, a huge content library there the question is, is there to your point is there a through line i'm i'm sure there is and but it's how to work that into your your current uh workflow um mm. yeah so, so there might be certain topic topics like techniques like legato on guitar for instance mm -hmm. that i'm sure i've got enough stuff that i could do something on that topic but i wouldn't want to just reuse stuff if that makes sense i'd want to try sure. and present it in a different way so those are some thoughts that i've, I've got and i like a bit of a blind spot for me personally where the larger project i haven't really got a sense of that at the moment yeah i think that asking your followers so sometimes the advice I've heard in this respect is to ask them what they're interested in, mm. you know, what would they like more of in the form of a course mm. and putting out polls saying, what are the key things you struggle with? For me, I, I articulated this to one other person. I think the idea would be that I'd start off with one sort of mini project, if that makes yeah. sense. So like a, yeah. a smaller thing as a proof of concept that I could actually do a project that spans like days rather than just one day yeah so that looking beyond one day for me at the moment is like a challenge i guess except for if i bank several things in one day yeah. so for knowing that i actually got advice from jack gardner incredible guitarist on this who had a baby i think maybe like two three years before and he said I wish I had banked some videos. Mm. So I took that on board and then I had like 30 videos that over time I had put away so that eventually when I got stuck in hospital for five days <laughs> with my wife and <laughs> baby that I had that to fall back on. So I think that probably shows that the ability to bank a thing, it shows that you can look forward a bit long yeah. term. Right? In but small it's... increments, right? Mm. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm sure there's, I mean, I, a lot of people would be interested in what you come up with. Why not? It might be a rubbish idea. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Enough of that humility. <laughs> yeah. That is, yeah, one thing I definitely need to figure out. Well, this has been great. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know it's it's quite a bit later. I'm in Florida, so yeah. it's, uh, it's my afternoon, but uh, it's getting uh, well into the evening for you. So, um, how how should people reach you so the main engine is youtube so youtube.com slash john nathan cordy um that has been the thing that has actually been more interesting for me instagram is there too and i post sort of clips and stuff up there the youtube became a bit more interesting to me because it was yeah you could do a longer video you could talk about ideas and People could ask you what was that thing that you're doing there and you, that could then create another video idea. So it's been quite nice in that way. It's sort yeah. of self perpetuating John, I really appreciate your time and uh, best of luck with the, uh, the many souls in, under your roof. <laughs> I appreciate you making time from some guy that reached out as a, a little bit of a fanboy. Uh, <laughs> and from an old guy too, see, the age is a thing, but... Uh, I, I keep rocking as best I can. <laughs> well, thanks for asking. <laughs> so everyone, please encourage you to go to uh, John's YouTube channel and, and do all the things like subscribe, share, and uh, support his work. It's, it's great work. And uh, 
I uh, look forward to connecting with you all again soon with the next episode. So thanks again, John, for being on Titans of Transition. Thanks, Drew. Hey, thanks for joining me today on Titans of Transition. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please check the show notes for additional information.